I'm Jim Rosenthal. Welcome to Eye on Art. Today we're here in Western Massachusetts at a secret little pond location uh, with Mark Picard, a wildlife photographer. Mark, thank you for bringing me to your little hideaway. You're welcome. I'm uh, looking forward to going out in the little uh, pond buggy here and seeing the pond from the inside out, so to speak. Yeah, it's a whole different world out there in this. Uh, you get to see things you can't see from the shore. Um, you can maneuver wherever you want to go and things are you're kind of like an invisible man out there. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you developed your floating blind for uh, photographing all the wildlife in the pond? Well, depending on the light circumstances, as you can see, sometimes it's better to be on the other side of the pond than it is to be on this side of the pond. So I had to come up with a method of being able to transverse the pond and uh, quickly, so I developed this floating blind. In addition to that, it's very great for uh, camouflaging yourself from the animals. They can't actually see you. As if you were walking on the shore, the animals would see you and they would spook and fly off and, or run away and so forth. But with the floating blind, you can, you can just go anywhere you want um, unnoticed. You, you said that you adopted this from what uh, equipment a fly fisherman uses. Yeah, they, they have a, a, a form of this using an inner tube. Um, and I, I can't be out there in, in a swamp with an inner tube, though. The last thing I'd want to hear is pssst the noise so uh, you know it means you drown with all your equipment so I made it out of styrofoam and uh, that seems to cure that problem. Now uh, you're wearing uh, fly fisherman's waders? Yes because actually you're actually sitting in the water uh, approximately up to your waist so you need to be protected from the cold water which doesn't seem like it's cold but it actually is and uh, also from things like leeches and things like that. And now there's some special flippers uh, that you've adapted. Yeah, the uh, fly fishermen, thank, thank for them, they uh, made flippers so that you propel yourself backwards while you're in this uh, floating blind. In other words, you're sitting down and, and you're, you're kicking your legs kicking forward. Kicking your legs and forward and actually pushes the water away from you in the upward position um, so you propel yourself backwards. So any uh, mode of transportation is always backwards when you're in the, when you're in the floating blind. I see. Now, actually, uh, when I had a chance to try out your, your blind, I, I kind of felt it's almost like a combination of scuba diving and uh, canoeing. You're in the water, but you're paddling around with your head above the water, and you can also sneak up on the wildlife very quietly. Yeah, that's actually a good description. You know, uh, the main important thing is that you do sneak up on wildlife. Um, if you were exposed um, without any cover and not in this blind, uh, animals would see you and uh, you know fly away or run away or swim away or whatever. Let's talk a little bit also about the uh, the evolution of this pond, how it started. Well, this was actually a meadow with, uh, with trees growing in it. Um, the trees grew up to become regular full-size trees. Um, at one point, a beaver came through and said, you know what, this would make a great little pond. Um, So he ended up damming one end of it, as you can see, there's the 100-foot dam that, that they built. And then they maintained that dam for years and years and years, and before you know it, all the trees uh, are underwater, so they, they drowned out, and there's the remnants of the, of the live tree. And the herons spot this, and they fly in and start building their nests in there. So they create, beaver is a, another animal that creates its whole entire ecosystem.
To find out more about beavers and the pond environment, I visited David Gallup, president of the Springfield Naturalist Club. Gallup. Hi, I'm David Gallup, and we're here in East Long Meadow, uh, and um, we're going to tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, I was born and raised in uh, northern Michigan up by Lake Superior, and uh, where the woods are wild and uh, there aren't too many people. And my uncle was a professional trapper, and my father and his family were hunters, so I had a time in the woods growing up and learning about the... Uh, the North Woods of Northern Michigan. David, tell me a little bit about the evolution of the beaver pond. The beaver is probably the only animal, mammal, that can actually change the landscape uh, as much as we do, as much as humans do. Um, they can dam a stream that winds to a wooded area and change it uh, within months to a, uh, to a flood zone, to a pond, providing a, a multitude of homes and environments for, uh, for many animals. Uh, quite the engineers, they can build dams, they build wonderful uh, beaver lodges, and um, raise families uh, every year in that area. And then when the, uh, when the beavers finally do move uh, from that uh, environment and travel upstream or downstream where there's more food, uh, that uh, dam finally breaks and uh, the pond uh, empties and it turns into another environment uh, that's uh, home for many other kind of animals like rabbits and rodents and uh, so it, uh, it's, it keeps going on and on and uh, when that uh, uh, meadow grows into a forest it provides uh, food for deer and, uh, and other animals that uh, use that edge wood uh, forest type environment. Uh, basically they, they cut their uh, uh, their sticks, uh, and they they actually impel the sticks in in mud at an angle, and with those angles they keep building and building and building, weaving those sticks and uh, making actually a dam and uh, impacting mud in those sticks, and those two little those two little front feet of the beaver it will actually use the tail to balance itself. And walk on the high, on its hind feet with mud in the little hands, and pack that mud down into the dam, into the sticks that they've been building in the dam. And they will do this over and over again. Families of beavers all night working very hard to uh, to build these dams. It's uh, it's tremendous uh, work that these animals do, uh, but they're creating their whole environment. Okay, when the beaver cuts the tree down, uh, they don't eat the wood of the tree. They cut the tree down, and then they proceed to, to uh, decapitate the tree, basically, take the canopy off the tree. And uh, that's where all the succulent branches are, where the food is. And then they will float those branches down the canals, uh, close to the lodge, and uh, their activities increase in late summer and fall uh, when, they start have, when they have to start building a cache for their long winter time in the lodge when the pond is frozen. But the beaver um, pair up and then they do find a place, they do build a dam, build a lodge, and then um, they do mate and have uh, young in the spring. It is truly a family unit and I think that's what the Native Americans admired about the beaver. Because not only are they monogamous, but they have a family unit where everyone works together. The young kids, the teenagers, they all work together. When the children grow up, what happens? Well, when the children grow up, they actually stay there for at least two years, sometimes three years. And in doing so, they help raise the next year's litter. So you have teenage beavers raising or helping with the, with the young of the next generation. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And, and eventually, of course, the food sources dwindle, as you did say, and, um, and the young uh, of the first year are basically sent on their way. And what happens is that they will go upstream and downstream and find their little niche and build their dam and ma you know, find a mate and, and the whole thing just goes on and on. So everything, you know, everything, everything we see in nature uh, is there for a purpose. And it creates either a home, an environment, or food uh, for other creatures. 
and it's it's a it's a circle of life, like a web of life. And uh, when that web is broken or disturbed, uh, and then things start falling apart. And we are a part of that web of life. Uh, so uh, everything you see in that pond, be it water lilies, uh, grasses, uh, is is all there for a purpose, and it all helps and uh, gives lifeblood to many different species in that pond. And there are many, many species in that beaver pond, not only animals and bird species, but uh, fish and insects uh, galore that uh, live in that pond. The beaver has made uh, an environment even better for white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer are animals of the edge, animals of the edge forest. They're not deep forest animals, they're animals of uh, marshes and uh, open areas and uh, brush areas and uh, forests. So the, uh, the beaver pond creates all those environments for the whitetail. They have a, a water source, they have a good food source, and uh, they're close to, uh, uh, to a wooded area where they can uh, disappear in a few jumps and leaps. Uh, but they do uh, come down by the ponds and uh, and of course, the water source is always there for them. What about ducks and geese? How do they utilize the beaver pond? The ducks like the beaver ponds because the beaver ponds have a multitude of, um, of reeds and grasses growing on the edge of the ponds where they can really uh, hide, you know, and, uh, and uh, sort of stay all day in sort of a concealed area and then go out into the pond, and uh, of course all of us have seen ducks upside down in the pond uh, gathering food. Um, but uh, I think, uh, the, well I know, the ducks uh, need, um, they need places of cover to hide. As all the animals that are always uh, hunted by predators, you know, they're always on the lookout. You know, the uh, the geese that we have here in New England, uh, through generations, have been fed uh, along these uh, these cultivated ponds and parks, and uh, now they have generations of geese that don't. I don't think they know how to fly south anymore. Uh, they've been uh, fed so much, and it's a, it's it's not a good thing because um, they really can't survive on their own, and a lot of them don't make it through the winter. So would you say that the populations that we see in a wilderness setting are, are different populations from the ones that we see in the yes, yes, ponds, absolutely. parks? Yeah, yeah. I think the geese that come down from the northern reaches of Canada uh, on their flyways, they're, um, they're wild geese that, that have that instinctive uh, moving capacity to keep going on their migration flight. But what has happened with a lot of Canada geese here that we see is that they have stopped here uh, two generations ago and were fed and were enticed to stay here, had new uh, young in the spring, and of course the, it just goes on and on. In, in the pond that we were uh, visiting, there were a number of trees, dead trees, standing in the middle of the pond that had heron's nests up in the top. This is the type of site that they look for? Absolutely. This is an ideal site for the great blue heron because they can build their nests high, away from predators. I mean, the heron will also build their nest on the ground, but you know they're exposed to, um, to a multitude of predators. And Way. They have to really be on guard, but that nest being up in that dead tree gives them an ideal place, and uh, the nests are, are quite magnificent, built of course of a multitude of sticks and branches, and then lined with uh, uh, fine uh, feathers and uh, grasses. They're very beautiful. The great blue heron arrives in New England each spring and repopulates its old nest. They lay from one to six eggs, which hatch about a month later. From that point on, the parents are very busy feeding these hungry young birds. Over the next couple of months, the birds eat 
an enormous amount of food. Fortunately, the parents are adept hunters and good providers. It's fascinating to watch them stalking their prey. With their long legs, they stand motionless in a shallow body of water. With their keen eyesight, they can see every detail, every movement below the surface. When they see a fish, their neck shoots out with lightning speed, grasping the fish between its beak. It brings it to the surface. The heron has to swallow its food head first, so it takes its food to the shore, lifts its neck up, and maneuvers it until it can swallow it whole in one gulp. then it's back to the nest to feed its young. This is repeated time after time over the course of the day, over the weeks and months, as the young grow even larger than their parents before they leave the nest. At that point, the young learn to fish, and spend the next couple of months strengthening themselves for the migration south before the next winter. The shallow waters of the pond provide an excellent source of food consisting of fish, frogs, and tadpoles for both the adults and the young after they fledge. The great blue herons find their favorite spots within the pond and you can visit time after time and find them fishing the same waters. The young grow quickly in strength through the autumn. Both the young and the adults will fly south before the pond surface freezes. Sometimes the heron ventures into water a little deep and gets its wings wet. Unlike geese and ducks, it does not have natural oils to keep its feathers dry. Then you can see the heron on the banks, enjoying the sun, drying his feathers so that he can resume flight. Autumn comes to the beaver pond in New England. The foliage puts on its annual spectacle of golds and reds. Animals prepare for the winter ahead. Turtles dig into the mud. The great blue herons 
feet and strengthen for their flight south. As the days become cooler, the nights crisper, soon an early snow falls on the beaver pond. Beavers gather the tender shoots from the tops of trees, stick them into the mud near the opening to their dens. These will provide a food source throughout the winter. The ducks and the geese linger a while longer, but soon as the pond surface freezes, they too will migrate south for the winter migrate to an area where the pond surface will not freeze and they will have access to the aquatic plants on the bottom, their source of food. The red-throated woodpecker is a hardy bird that stays north throughout the winter. With its great hearing, it climbs the tree, listening for insects stirring below the surface bark. It cocks its head to bring its ear closer, pinpoints the insect, reaches in and gobbles it up. Many people erroneously consider the cardinal a songbird of summer. If you venture out on a winter's day, 
you will likely find him in the trees looking for seeds. He too stays in the northern ponds throughout the winter. Let's uh, conclude on a slightly different note. And you talked about how uh, Springfield and some of the towns in the Connecticut River Valley were founded on the beaver trade. And now I'd like to ask you, legislation was recently passed banning trapping of beavers. And I've heard that this uh, ban on the trapping uh, may cause the beaver populations to overrun many areas. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a real touchy subject. Of course, leg hole traps have been banned here in Massachusetts. Um, and in doing so, um, the beaver population, as you said, has exploded. Um, the beaver population is a problem, and it has to be addressed. Um, again, we run into humans and animals. Uh, it, it runs a gamut. It runs with, with bear and deer and all the animals that, of environments that we're we're invading. We're, we're building suburbs after suburbs after suburbs up into the forests and, and waterways of New England, and uh, we're encountering close up many of these animals that have lost their environments. In the beaver's uh, case, they actually aren't losing their environment, they're making more environment because they're very adaptable. And those environments, of course, are, are having, we're having a lot of problems with the water. The beaver uh, in this area in the valley here, in these urban areas, have they're very, you know, they have no predators here, they're, but man, really. But I, there are people out there that are working on uh, adaptation, on working on uh, building spillway pipes for these ponds to keep them in check. And uh, if, I think if we put our minds uh, uh, to thinking about the uh, ways that we can live in harmony with, with the beaver and other animals, uh, especially the beaver, I think we might be able to do it. I, I, you know, I'm saying that there are, are going to be cases where it just can't be done, that the beaver has to be moved or the beaver has to be taken away. Uh, but I think we can, we can work on it.